Forbes Books presents The Sky's the Limit with host D. Brown, the president and CEO of the P3 Group, the nation's largest minority, public, private, partnership real estate developer. Here's D. This week, my guest is best-selling author and philanthropist, John Hope Bryant. John advocates for economic empowerment through his nonprofit, Operation Hope, and is the founder of the Promise Homes Company, one of the largest minority-controlled owners of single-family residential rental property in the U.S. John, welcome to The Sky's the Limit. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Love the title of, the, of your podcast. Thank you. Hey, man, look, we, uh, we're happy to have you here, and uh, we want to get into the show. So um, I want to start off by asking you, I've watched you on television, obviously, and read a lot about you. And you often uh, you've been referred to as the conscious of capitalism. And you've told even presidential candidates that you have um, contributed your success uh, to capitalism. You're the second guest on my podcast, actually, who has expressed a profound appreciation for capitalism. The other one is Warren Stevens. Talk to me about your love of capitalism. Capitalism is actually a horrible system except for every other system. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, similar, like, it's similar to democracy in that regard. It's like, you know, it's just really not an, a great system, except that every other system is horrible. I'm getting some t-shirts made now that says Black Capitalists Matter. It's flying in the face of the perception that, it, particularly in the Black community in particular, that money is evil. No, no, no. The Bible says the love of money is evil. Right. Uh, That's right. This is part of, you know, Malcolm X's famous quote, we've been bamboozled, we've been tricked, we've been fooled. Ambassador Andrew Young said that Dr. King's right arm in the civil rights movement on that balcony with Dr. King when he was assassinated, my mentor, right. would say today to live in a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. We escape physical slavery, physical bondage in 1865, but then we were graduated into to debt enslavement because we didn't have the memo on how money works or how wealth creation works. The Freedmen's Bank of 1865, March, was run by another capitalist after Lincoln's assassination called Frederick Douglass. Now, people listening to this might be historians and go, oh, Frederick Douglass was a, an abolitionist. Well, the only reason he's able to do that is because he owned $60 million worth of real estate and he rented it out right. to working class blacks, which gave him financial freedom. So all money is, is freedom. That's all, that's all it really is. It's freedom to go, move, do, uh, when you want, what you want, whoever you want, however you want. And capitalism is an opportunity for you to self-actualize yourself, to achieve generational wealth, accumulate some money, wealth more than money, those two things are different. Right. Um, and gives you options in life. You can't, I, I think the short version of what I'm saying is that the last movement was in the streets and that was civil rights. This movement in the 21st century is in the suites, the business suites, that's right. civil rights. This issue is about class and poverty and, and self-determination through free enterprise and capitalism. And, and even, even to quote Shimon Perez, God rest his soul, he told me one day, 15 years ago, he said, John, people are going to criticize your work. And when they do, you tell them, even if you want to distribute money like a socialist, you got to first collect it like a capitalist. So if you really know how money works right. in the world, we're all capitalists. That what people right. are really talking about the, is that they're talking about a, a progressive tax system. And that's all they're talking about. The Nordic socialist countries in Europe, they're capitalist countries. They just have a very progressive and aggressive tax system. And we can get into why and all that stuff if you want. But they're making money the same way. I mean, China, a communist country, Russia, a communist country, are capitalists. <laughs> right. Very good point. Now, now, John, you grew up in Compton, right? Yes, sir. South Central Los Angeles and then South, Compton. South Central LA. Okay. So tell me, coming from South Central LA, how did you learn about capitalism? So I learned the hard way, first of all, which is probably the smartest way to learn or the best way to learn because you only have to learn once. Uh, once you get that lesson, you don't want to get it again. So my mother and my father argued over money, fought over money, domestic abuse happening in my household. Number one cause of divorce is money. Right. And we we had a we had a I tell all this by the way, my newest book up from nothing. If anybody wants to get it, uh, which came out my, last October, 
the untold story of how we all succeed, which is really about managing your failures, not so much celebrating your successes. Because right. if you manage your failures, you will become a success. If you get the right mindset, you will become a success. So my mom had the right mindset. My dad did, did not. My dad was very pride, prideful, very smart guy. Ambassador Young says that men and women fail for three reasons, arrogance, pride, and greed. My dad wasn't greedy, but he was full of pride. And he wouldn't listen to my mom, who was a financial and credit genius. So we had a gas station. We owned, we accumulated our own home, an eight-unit apartment building, a gas station, a cement contracting business. I mean, we had like six businesses, and we lost it all um, because my dad could make it but couldn't keep it. So that he made a dollar, and we spent a dollar fifty. The more money we made, the broker we got. Okay, so family destroyed, divorce. Mom goes one way, dad goes another. I live with my mother, my uh, play uncle who saved my life. Uh, swallowing my tongue. Uh, he let us stay in his house. Uh, he went to go sell some drugs part time, some marijuana be- to make some extra money. To make a long story short, he rides his bicycle from where they were selling marijuana. He gets w- run down by a car, a truck that was full of drug dealers from the neighborhood he was selling drugs in. They were making a point. You're in the wrong turf. So he gets killed right in front of me. He was my second lesson on uh, bad capitalism yeah. or making money, but not building wealth. Those two things are different. So I'm seven years old now. Okay. Now I'm nine years old and my best friend, George, who was smarter than me, uh, but had really bad role models and parents who weren't supportive. He ends up hanging out with my next door neighbor who was a drug dealer. Long story short, he gets shot and killed with tweet the next door neighbor. I'm now nine. So in addition to just being traumatized by all this stuff emotionally, and I think it's probably why I'm so resilient today because I dealt with all this and it's made me stronger. Uh, but in addition to that, I started getting this memo, like making money and getting paid is overrated. My dad tried to get paid, but he didn't build well. He ended up broke. I took care of him the last 15 years of his life after 54 years of running a business. My uncle, play uncle, tried to make some money in addition to working a legitimate job. He ended up dead. Okay, drug dealing, there's no retired drug dealers. That's probably a bad occupation and it's bad karma. Okay, my best friend was smarter than me, but I actually never told this story before this way. My best friend was smarter than me, had better grades, but he ended up with the wrong, he had the wrong culture, culture is everything, he ends up dead. Okay, trying to make some money. I don't wanna do that either. So I'm sitting there trying to figure out, D, how can I build some wealth? What is the mindset? So I go to school, I'm nine years old. And this banker, this white banker, so most people in my neighborhood, they had a bad experience with white people, a white male. It's probably a police officer throwing them against a patrol car or something. My experience with a white male was this banker who, because of the Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed in 1977, basically says that banks have to reinvest in underserved neighborhoods like mine. Right. Right. He came to teach financial literacy in my home economics class, which doesn't exist anymore. And I raised my hand in the class. I said, excuse me, sir, what do you do for a living? And how did you get rich legally? And he looked at me and he was, I guess he was trying to figure out, figure out when I was serious. <laughs> I was dead serious. <laughs> the question was serious. The question was right. serious, right? And because I, I never seen a, a, a man in a suit, a white man in a suit who wasn't a detective. Right? <laughs> and, and, and this dude looked legitimate. It was a really nice suit. I mean, this wasn't a broke dude. And he said, young man, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. I said, sir, I don't know what an entrepreneur is. I never heard that that word before, but if it's legal and you're financing it, I'm going to be one. <laughs> so that's, that's, that, that's a short version. I mean, I can tell you more, but that's, I started my first business then literally the next, um, the next year, when I was 10 years old and I've been wow. an entrepreneur ever since it just, it just changed everything in my life. Yeah. It's something that's in your blood when you are a true entrepreneur. It's, I don't. I don't think you can teach that in school. I think it's it's ingrained in your in your DNA. But you you hit on a subject um, that in in fact I interviewed Percy Miller. We we touched on this kind of gently as well, but we started talking about wealth and and generational wealth, right? And so we know obviously within the African American community particularly, uh, that term is not one that I think has been uh, taught enough to uh, leaders of families and, and businesses, et cetera. 
And so you stated, just like I've mentioned many times, there's a fundamental difference between being rich, uh, having money, and being wealthy. Can you kind of expand on that generational wealth and and what does it mean uh, from your perspective? Yeah, there's a difference between being broke and being poor. Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind, sort of what we've been talking about here, and a a depressed condition of your spirit. And you must vow never to be poor again. Um, And a lot of folks in my neighborhood where I grew up and in my communities today, they aren't broke, they're poor. They're like they're, they're they're depressed. When you're broke, you have a a, a, a hustling mentality. You, you you don't have any money, but you're out there. You're trying to make it, and right. um, and you have a strivers mentality, and you've got a you know you want to be part of the middle class. You want to you know you you're trying to come up. Uh, you want to be a winner, which is you have the struggling class, the thriving class, and the winning class. And winners are builders, and strivers are the emerging middle class. And but surviving mentality. That's really, I mean, that's depression. You're an expert at what you're against, not what you're for. You think the world's all against you. You got a chip on your shoulder. You're you're angry at the world or not feeling at all, which is worse. I, I think that the light that I'm trying to get to come on everybody's head is that anger is not a strategy and frustration right. is not a business plan. Right. And I'm trying to get folks into the right mental approach of their life. Like, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Depends who's looking at the glass. It's the same glass. Right. Whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I take no for vitamins. Fine. Tell me no. Tell me can't. Tell me impossible. I don't can't and impossible, not even in my dictionary. Success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. These are not phrases that I use. This is the way I live my life. So right. so th- that mean that means that you can't hurt me. Not you, you, but you, whomever is interested in hurting me, I'm bulletproof to you because my my self-esteem and self-worth does not depend on your acceptance of me. God right. made me great, not you. So I can make a mistake and not be a mistake. So mental, right. let me put it another way. Let's flip the script because maybe some of the people listening to this need some like really basic evidence of what I'm saying. Let's just, somebody's listening to this going, no, John, John's wrong. This is really just about money. Forget building wealth. This is about making money. Just give me some money. Okay, if I took all the money in the world, redistributed to everybody on the planet equally from the top 3%. Within three to five years, the top 3% will have all the money again. <laughs> right. <laughs> if I stop it, if I, if I stop it, because they got the memo on, on how wealth creation works and everybody else did not. If I stop at an off ramp, give a homeless man, if I won the lottery maybe, give the homeless man a million dollars, he'll be broke in six months, dude. That's right. If, if nothing else changes in his life other than I gave him a million dollars, he'll be broken six months because his mindset hasn't changed. His life has, right. hasn't changed. Right. You're making a powerful point, and I, I don't think I could have summed it up any better. Uh, I do want to take a, a swing back in time to 1992. Uh, I mentioned that you are the founder of Operation Hope, and you founded Operation Hope back in 1992, immediately after the Rodney King uh, riots. Uh Tell us about your motivation to start Operation Hope and what the mission of the organization is. Yes, I created Operation Hope because I believe in 1992 and I believe in 2021 that we're sitting in a moment in history, more so now than then. Um, But history doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. It just feels like another day. Right. But that doesn't but that doesn't mean the moment is actually not historic. When t- in 1992, it was right. It was at that point, the worst riot in U.S. history. Watts riots before that. Uh, it was that inflection moment where you could do something. And in South Central L.A., a lot of things had the potential to change as a result of Rodney King losing uh, his justice, sense of justice in that trial with the officers who beat him. He subsequently died. God rest his soul. Today, though, George Floyd gave his life almost like a martyr. Didn't give his life. His life was taken. But I think that rainbows you know, follow storms. We now have this 400 year old social justice reckoning, I call it the black America. Uh, and it, and I'm, really, I'm really executing on what I planned in 1992. 1992, I said, I'm, I, I wanna eradicate poverty as we know it in my lifetime. I wanna move us from civil rights to civil rights. I said, I wanna move renters to homeowners and small business dreamers into small business owners and dreamers into owners and doers. And 
I said this check cashing customers and the banking customers. This is 1992. But what I was essentially saying was, I'm going to finish the work of the Freedmen's Bank of 1865, chartered to teach free slaves about money. I want to create a, a sustainable economic system, infrastructure for black America, and by extension, to help underserved America, which include my poor white friends, to refine their talents and skills such that they can compete in, a, in the largest economy on the planet and build wealth and add two to 3% of GDP. So I have four goals, the same goals that I had back then, create an economic infrastructure and a system, rebootable, scalable, software upgradable for black America. Every other race has it, every other culture has it, except us. Number two, I mean, even Native American Indians have a form of an infrastructure, which, which is called you know casinos and gambling. I don't agree with it, but at least they have some kind of sustainable economic system. We, black folks, right. we're just great consumers, $1.4 trillion a year in consumer spending. We'd be one of the largest economies in the world if it was based on spending, but, but that's but spending and wealth creation are literally two different things. So right. one, economic infrastructure. Two, to help the bottom 50% of the economy, which includes my poor white friends uh, and Latinos and Asians and Indians and other, to come up two to 3% of GDP growth. That's my last book, Up From Nothing. Third thing is through Operation Hope to become America's financial coach, uh, like the private banker to the average American citizen uh, uh, who got too much a month at the end of their money and they get the bank out of the no business and into the yes business again. Yes, you can become a homeowner. Yes, you can become a small business owner. Yes, you can send your kids to college. Yes, you can have access to credit. So because you cannot have a modern growth economy without good debt uh, and, 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 and a good banking system that supports you. And then the fourth thing is to be a bit of a, as you said earlier, I guess, a conscious on capitalism. Absolutely. During the same time, shortly after the riots, you started the Bankers Bus Tour. And I think the fires were still burning uh, from the riots at the time that you started that tour. Tell us a little bit more about the Bankers Bus Tour. You do your homework, my man. Bankers Bus Tour <laughs> was uh, um, like a trade mission to France or Latin America or, you know, it's a, tra a trade mission to Asia. Only this is a trade mission to South Central LA. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that if you were an executive in downtown Los Angeles, you drove, your driver drove you right through South Central every day and you never stopped to look around. But this is a gold mine. I mean, it's 15 minutes from the airport, 15 right. minutes from downtown Los Angeles. 15 minutes from the beach, 15 minutes from the port, ports of Los Angeles, five minutes from two freeways. I mean, it's centrally located real estate, uh, but we called it South Central LA, i.e. Black, the Black community, and we devalued it. And what I said, no, is no, 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 we just don't, under, we don't see the values in front of us. An inner city in France is called Paris. <laughs> An inner city right. in, the U, in the UK is called London. I mean, my God, the inner city in Turkey is called Istanbul. So let's take you guys, put you on a bus, bankers bus tour, investors, bankers, whatever, and let me walk you through and storytell. This is where I began to, to learn the power of storytelling. Let me tell the story of this community, where it came from, who used to live here, who lives here now, the economics of the country, the city, the buying power, uh, the, and look, these are tree-lined, beautiful, well-maintained streets. This this could be in Pasadena. If I, if you didn't know where you were, and I cl and you closed your eyes, dude, right? You think you were you think you were in Pasadena, California, or or Beverly Hills, maybe, or you know. But this was South Central Los Angeles, tree-lined, well-maintained. Pride of ownership is not black <laughs> or white <laughs> or Latino right. or Asian. Right. It's just pride of ownership. So it was it was really about telling retelling our story through an economic lens. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, uh, Operation Hope has uh, one of the most impressive boards uh, of advisors that I've seen. I think you recently added the Chief Executive Officer of Experian North America. Uh, talk to yeah. me about your, the importance of surrounding yourself with uh, great talent. Oh my God, man. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is everything. Like, culture is not the most important thing in business. It's the only thing in business. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it's actually the only thing in your life. People listening to this podcast from their home, your household has a culture. Right. You're listening to it from work. Your job has a culture. 
the division of your job you're in, the department, the, the building your job is in has a culture. Uh, you're looking and listening to this from, from the car. The neighborhood you're driving through right now has a culture. culture. You know, this country we're in, we're not a country, we're an idea. America's an idea. We can make her or remake her, whatever we want. Everything is culture. So if you, so here's a real dramatic expression of that. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so the opposite of that D is also true. You know, I, 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 my first job, this is also from my book up from nothing. My first job, big real job was working as a bu a bus boy at a restaurant. I lived in South Central LA and I could have got a restaurant, a job, you know, IHOP or whatever some little restaurant in my community i'm like well these people, nobody nobody around here can help me with anything <laughs> i mean they're all broke right. like me <laughs> right so i got I, I got on the bus and and took a bus for an hour to lower santa monica i, I confused palisades with palafurries but i think it's palisades i got a job at gladstones for a fish restaurant and i worked there for a couple of weeks d and i realized the people who i was waiting on you know attorneys, accountants, professionals. Okay, you know, much better than yeah. I was doing in South Central LA, but I'm like, well, that, that I'm not aiming high enough. I want to be an owner. I don't want to be a person servicing the owners. So right. I took another bus, another 30 minutes up the coast to a fancy restaurant called Joffrey's. And I met my first billionaire, uh, Harvey Baskin, who financed the restaurant for his lover, Joffrey Etienne. And I met Jeff, Joffrey Etienne and met and met Joff and met Harvey Baskin. And I got the, they gave me a, the worst shift they had Monday nights, <laughs> a bus boy and a waiter on Monday night shift. That's the deadest day in a restaurant. Right. Uh, but they gave me that job and I was really lousy at it. It wasn't very good, but I did, I did well enough to hang around so that Harvey hired me as his assistant. Man, shoot. I, I mean, once I start working with Harvey and worked out of the Malibu, out of his Malibu beach house, uh, which was formerly the Malibu train station to convert it is three, four story beach house. I mean, it was gorgeous. I'm going, okay, this is a whole different world here now. Right. And, right. um, I took him to dinner. This again, all these stories in my book, I took him to dinner one night, uh, to ask him a bunch of questions and we go to dinner and I'm driving him like driving this day and he's in the back seat and I'm driving his leg, his foot's broken. So he's in the backseat with his leg extended. I don't care how I look. <laughs> so he just, he's a billionaire. And I want to I want to suck his brain for knowledge. So I go to dinner and uh, ask him a bunch of questions. After dinner's over, um, he the bill comes and he slides me the bill to pay it. It's like a hundred bucks, which was everything back then. He only paid me like <laughs> he only paid me like eighteen thousand dollars a year back then, right? So I, I slid the bill back over to him. He slid the bill back to me. I slid the bill back to him. He slid the bill back to me. I trust. Slid. He said, stop, stop, stop. He said, Look. he said, what are you doing? I said, hey, man, you're the, you're the old uber rich dude. I work for you. You know how much money I make. I'm, you know, you, you pay it. He said, Look, you have, to, you have to decide what you want. Do you want to pick my brain or pick my pocket? <laughs> and I, I quietly did. Pull the bill back over. <laughs> Pulled out my little raggedy wallet and paid it and asked him questions the entire way back home. That was my education. That was my university. Yeah. Mentors, role models, asking right. questions, being curious. What did Quincy Jones say? Uh, he said, you know, how'd you get so smart? I'm just nosy as hell. That's right. Okay. Well, hang on a minute, John. We have to stop right here. But coming up in the second part of my discussion, with best-selling author and philanthropist John Hope Bryant, John talks about how his Promise Homes company is helping improve the home ownership rate among Black Americans. So we have a rent-to-own strategy that if you pay our rent on time to us, we'll sort of back you after three to five years to go buy a home. You can buy a home from us out of our portfolio, or you can go buy it. We had a couple people just go buy homes, and we helped you with that process we essentially back you know vouched for you with the lender this has been the sky's the limit with d brown to find out more about d go to dbrownco.com and to connect with the p3 group check out the p3 group inc.com the sky's the limit is a production of forbes books 
Forbes Books presents The Sky's the Limit with host D. Brown, the president and CEO of the P3 Group, the nation's largest minority, public, private, partnership real estate developer. Here's D. I'm back with best-selling author and philanthropist John Hope Bryant, the founder of Operation Hope and the founder of the Promise Homes Company. John, we've talked about what you're doing with Operation Hope. And I want to get into your Promise Homes Company. But before we do, I want to talk about your book, Up From Nothing, The Untold Story of How We All Succeed. And in it, you say one of the biggest problems in America today is radical indifference. What did you mean by that? Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr., dealt with something much more pervasive and dangerous. Uh, He dealt with, uh, at least on the surface, he dealt with love and hate. I love you or I hate you. And I'm going to express my hate. I may or may not express my love, but I'm certainly going to express my hate towards you. He knew exactly how people felt about him. What we have been dealing with for the last going on 30 years, in my opinion, is not love or hate. It's a sliding scale into what I call radical indifference. Folks who don't actually care for you enough to hate you. (laughs) <laughs> so I put this in my two books ago, the How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, I believe I, I described it. I think I retold a v- large version of the story in this current book. But I was in Harlem and this black man was talking about President Reagan, then President Reagan. And we, he and I were born on the same day and I knew President Reagan. He said, oh, President Reagan's a racist. I said, no, I, I, I know Re- President Reagan. I mean, he's not my cup of tea. He's not, his policies weren't my policies, but He's a decent guy. I don't think he's a racist. Oh, no, President Reagan was a racist. I said, look, I really don't think he's a racist. I said, look, President Reagan don't hate you. He don't know you. He's got no relationship to you. He don't know black people. He's not related to black people. He's not married to a sister. He don't hate you. He ain't thinking about you. <laughs> he's indifferent to you. Because there's no relationship. And to the extent that he has a relationship, he's got the, back then I'd say the Congressional Black Caucus or whatever the group was, would have been calling him every name but the son of God because they didn't like his policies. I said, somebody's calling you a racist. So you have no relationship to Black America. The only Black people you know are legislators saying you're a racist. So there's a bill that shows up on your desk to sign and help Black people. Are you inclined to sign it? (laughs) Right, right. I mean, for what? Why? So I say he, he, it, it's it's the indifference that kills you, you know, and yeah. that's what I was trying to get around with that bankers bus tour in South Central LA. Was I'm trying to I was trying to whip indifference. People were just rolling their eyes and you know got their head in the sky and could care less. It's like Beirut was burning, but this is not Beirut. This is your neighborhood right in front of you. I was trying to reweave right. the fabric of society again. That we are all our brother's keeper. We're all. God's children. We're all in this thing together. And that's why I think this moment, by the way, now is more powerful than that moment. That was about just black and brown people in South Central LA primarily. And what's going on right now, you know, after 2020, I mean, 2020 scarred everybody. That's true. And everybody saw George Floyd publicly lynched. Everyone. And I think everybody was, everybody who got even remotely some sense of justice in their soul found that to be completely unacceptable. And that's not the nation they want to live in. And so I just think that we're in a different moment and we have a chance, even with all the division and challenges right now, we have a chance to come back to each other. But I think we need a different strategy and a different approach to to achieve that. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I want to talk about an initiative you launched in April. Uh, You vowed to create 1 million Black entrepreneurs and businesses via a $130 million fund with Shopify. Man, I'm not doing, I'm not doing any more interviews with you. You do too much research. You, 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 uh, you, you be nailing a brother. You, you don't let, you don't let anybody get away with anything. Like, you like, let me, I want you like, on front street. Let me tell you what you say. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know, look, we have a, we have some great producers here that, that they help me out a lot with my research as well. So I do a, a, a good job myself, but they're, they're great. Kudos to them. Yeah. So we, we have, we, um, you know, I cut all these deals over the internet, by the way. I mean, I did, $300 million worth of agreements. And I never met any of these people. I did it all over oh, wow. Zoom. 
Really? Um, and, yeah, and that's a sort of an untold story. I don't think I've ever said that publicly. Again, never say never, never, never say what you can't yeah. do. I did more, I closed more deals over Zoom in 12 months than I have done than deals I personally have cut and closed over 12 years. So $130 million, 10 year deal. It's a funny story behind that as, as well. 10 year deal with the second largest e-commerce company in the world to create a million new black businesses, both brick and mortar or just traditional businesses, but also e-commerce businesses. 96% of black businesses don't have an employee. They're sole proprietors. Um, right. Probably the, around the same percentage are not on e-commerce. And you build wealth in your sleep. Like you literally build wealth in your sleep. That's literally right. how you do it. So if you're not on e-commerce, if you're a barbershop, all you're doing is making money, you're not building wealth, you're just cutting some hair and you're going home. And when I call at five o'clock to get make an appointment, you say, well, hold on a minute, I, I got a clippers in one hand, I got the phone in another, I can't write at the same time, I, I can't look at my appointment book, can you call me back? Maybe I'll call back, maybe I won't, but you've missed out on that opportunity. But if you're going right. to e-commerce, I'm sitting in my bed at midnight, I go to your website, and forget it to get it looking for a haircut. I make an appointment online. I put in my credit card number. If I cancel, you get to keep my money from the credit card. I, while I'm there, I shop for some hair brushes, so some hair oil, uh, you know, wave cap, right. you know. Yep. And you you come in tomorrow morning. You, hey, bingo! You know, you've made yeah. revenue in your sleep. That's that's the game changer. It is, and I tell um, young business owners all the time that. You know, the best real estate you can buy is online, right? I mean, yep. you if, when you open a business, I mean, that's the first thing people see uh, when they're introduced to your company. They, I mean, it's just a, it's the era we live in, right? So the first thing they're going to do is Google your company, Google you, yep. uh, and and that's so that's the front door to your to your enterprise. So you're yep. absolutely correct. Yeah, so we're very serious about it. Anybody listening to your program either wants to create a new business or wants to grow their existing business, we are providing a $25,000 package per business to help set them up, which includes the business training, credit score, correction and training, all the e-commerce licenses, uh, Shopify payment systems, delivery systems, you get a credit line for against the sales you make that grows as you grow the set, you grow the sales of the comp of the new company. And we have a bunch of professionals in the back end accountants, lawyers, bankers, insurance professionals, et cetera, who serve as a bit of a SWAT team for that new business owner uh, to gird up so that you can actually yeah. become an employer and a, and a real business and not just a self-employment project. Is there a website they should go to to get yes, more sir. information? Hope1mbb.org or operationhope.org. All right, great. That's, that's good information. And I know a lot of uh, young business owners out, out there listening can definitely use that information. One of the reasons I want, wanted you on my show is to talk to you about Promise Homes Company. And I know that's uh, an enterprise that you've grown and acquired properties over the years. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing in the um, Promise Home Company? Uh, I tell you what, you, you can't, nobody can come in here and do a lazy interview with you. That ain't happening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel like this is like a walk in talking Wikipedia. <laughs> um, uh, Promise Homes Company is uh, the, so Operation Hope is the largest nonprofit financial inclusion organization in America, the largest financial coach uh, nonprofit organization in America that is responsible for, for financial literacy policy in this country, amongst other things. Uh, the Promise Homes Company, as part of my for-profit companies, is the largest for-profit minority controlled owner of single family rental homes in America. So I own we own about $125 million worth of homes in Atlanta and North Florida, uh, just under 700 homes. We're about to buy some more next month. And I'm massively growing that business right now. Separate and apart, of course, from Operation Hope, separate offices, separate staff, separate everything. Also, we have contracted with Operation Hope. We pay a contract to Operation Hope to financially uh, counsel our residents in the Promise Homes Company, give them additional financial literacy, raise your credit score. As yeah. you raise your credit score, we reduce your rent. We give you financial incentives for paying your bills on time to us. As we have work to do in the homes, we hire as a priority minority and women owned businesses to do the landscaping, roofing, lighting, painting, electrical, and other work. My last report I got was that 64 
65% of all our vendors are minority owned vendors. And that just wouldn't have happened if I wasn't a black owned business. Right. Now we know that black Americans lag far behind other groups as, as it relates to home ownership. I think the rate right now is about uh, 44% home ownership, which is 5% behind Hispanics. Uh, white Americans are at 74% home ownership. So how's your work at um, Promise Homes helping to close this gap? So we have a rent to own strategy that if you pay our rent on time to us, we'll sort of back you after three to five years to go buy a home. You can buy a home from us out of our portfolio, or you can go buy, we had a couple people just go buy homes and we helped you with that process. We essentially back, you know, vouched for you with the lender. And um, we get Operation Hope to help you make sure you're, you're debt rate to income ratios are right and your credit score is is acceptable and you have enough money saved up it, it sounds like we're this goody two shoes organization i'm sure to some we're really not we're hardcore capitalists <laughs> it's just <laughs> i just i just it's just a different kind of capitalism i mean i just think you can be a capitalist and not be not have to be a jerk you don't you don't have to be cruel right um, well you know, i call it doing good by doing good yeah yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah you exactly. can you, yeah. you can make money and 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 also uh, do good work in the process. Oh yeah, and, and and you know if somebody is not paying me rent and they're doing it intentionally, maliciously, like they're just trying to game the system with me, you got to go. I, I've, I've said, I've said if somebody comes in, I'm giving a speech somewhere, five thousand people in the audience, pre or post COVID, and the person like gets up in the middle of my speech. John Hope Bryant, you ain't worth nothing. You you kick me out of one of your homes. I would respond and say, young lady, what's your name? Mrs. My name is Mrs. Jones. Okay, Mrs. Jones. There's a person in the audience that works for me. The name is blank blank. Let me please see them, right? After the program. Now let me finish my speech, but let me just say this. If you got kicked out of one of my houses, you really worked at it. Because I'm doing everything I can to try to help you help yourself. Now, if you just won't pay rent, you got to go. I'm not. I'm not. The, I'm not. So, I'm not some socialist uh, welfare program. I, I can't help. I can't help the legitimate residents who are trying to raise their family, do their thing. I can't give them all the services I just mentioned. To you. I can't help the minority vendors I just told you about. I can't do any of that good work unless people pay their rent. Right. Right. <laughs> so I. I, I'm real. I'm I'm transparent and, and full throttle about the whole thing. Like you know, help me, help you, help us. But if you're trying to game me, you got to go. Like like today. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, Atlanta has a pretty uh, hot housing market. So what do yeah. you see? I guess for the future of the Promise Company there in Atlanta. Buy as many homes as fast as I can. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'm trying to tell everybody, everybody, um, everybody who's listening to this. My wife came to Atlanta from New York, from Manhattan. And she's like, John, why is anybody renting? <laughs> she's like, look, you know, I, I'm not trying to talk against, you know, my family's own business here. But why is anybody renting anything? She came from Manhattan where, you know, rent in Manhattan before the pandemic was if you can pay five thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars a month in rent, you got a bargain, right? She's right. like, wait a minute. Wait. She's like, wait a minute. And you got like a nothing, like a five hundred square feet place, like no kitchen and, and no amenities. No, no. You pay for your parking separately, right? And she's like, wait a minute. Right. For a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month, you can get a fourteen hundred square foot house with a front yard, and a backyard, and and a parking <laughs> set, and a garage. You, know, you, she, you can buy that house. Like, why would you? Why would you rent? Anywhere, if you could go buy a house for hundred thousand dollars, it's yours. And that house that I bought for eighty-eight thousand, hundred thousand dollars is now worth almost two hundred thousand dollars. And and that was so I bought these in twenty seventeen. So until the average home value in my neighborhoods that I go after, low to moderate income working neighborhoods, yeah. uh, or workforce housing neighborhoods, lower middle class, working middle class, until those neighborhoods get to two hundred and fifty thousand, three hundred thousand dollars per house. I would still say they're affordable because you can get a, if you have a good credit score, you get a 5% mortgage with a $250,000, you know, purchase price, 10% down, you know, you still have a, a, a payment that's $1,500 a month or less. 
Right. That's yeah. affordable. And I tell people the real estate's not going down. It's going up. There's three things that have never, well, I don't want to be too provocative on this, 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 in this program. There are two <laughs> things. There are two things that have never gone backwards. No, I'll say three things. Um, I'll, I'll leave out one. One is the stock market over long, over the, over time. It's yeah. only increased. Uh, real estate values, there's been dips, but they all increase over time. Uh, right. They aren't growing any more land. Uh, and GDP, gross domestic product. The, the, the GDP of this country, gross domestic product, has always grown. So if you ride one of those three things, or ride two of the things, or one of the two things, you'll affect the third thing, the GDP, and you'll, you, you can't help but do better if you're riding that wave. I tell anybody listening to this, Go buy a house. Yeah, you know, we're almost ending where we started. Like all these misnomers in the black community, like, oh, buying a home is evil, and owning a home you don't own it. The bank owns it. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Like, the, the bank owns it if you don't pay your mortgage. Yeah, but by the way, right. if, I, if I loaned you the money, if you my cousin Pookie, and I loan you the money and you don't pay me, Pookie, I'm gonna own your house, right? So the right. bank, the, well, don't get upset with the bank. It always it kills me. D, these rappers, they, they, they want the loans of the bank for the for the Ferrari and this and that. But when the, the, when the career cools down and the bank wants the car back, all of a sudden the bank is a racist. Well, no, you weren't calling the bank a racist when they gave you the loan. Right. <laughs> now they, you, now they, want, they just want their money back, right? So I, I, again, I want my money back too. The home ownership is beautiful. You're leveraging good debt if you do it right. So oh, good debt is appreciate, bad debt depreciates. So don't finance jewelry, right? Don't finance your vacation. Don't finance a rental car, which I just learned that you can do when I was on vacation last week. Oh yeah, man, I was in Bahamas last week and I, uh -huh. my head almost exploded. You can finance your vacation to the resort at 36% interest, I almost passed out. Oh, wow. Um, I just so got back from the Bahamas myself. Uh, you, were, you were probably the rich dude on the plane next to me, flashing gold jewelry and had the little entourage. <laughs> That's probably you right next to me. So, so you get to write off the interest payments on the mortgage. You get the appreciation. So the value of the house, you benefit from that. And you value in the, so you benefit from taxes on depreciation. You write off the payments on interest expense and you benefit right. a wealth creation on appreciation. It's your house. Everything above the debt is yours. Whereas if you're just renting, including from me, you're paying off my mortgage. Right. Which I would be happy for you to do. <laughs> hey, that's capitalism for you, right? That's exactly what we've been talking about. John, I want to end on kind of a lighter note. I get an opportunity to watch a debate uh, with Shark Tank star Kevin O'Leary on CNBC. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't funny. think you've ever lost one, have you? <laughs> uh, he cheated one day, and I think that was a draw. <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, look, I'm biased. I think he's a nice guy, and I, I like Kevin. But he makes it. He sort of makes it easy for me to. I mean, some of the things that come out of his mouth are just sort of ridiculous. <laughs> well, John, let's listen. I appreciate you taking the time out to be on the show. We we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, like I said earlier at the beginning of the show, I look forward to perhaps connecting with you when I'm in uh, Atlanta sometime. And uh, oh, my pleasure. We'd love to have you back again. I got to take take my brain pills before I do an interview with you again. <laughs> you, you, you ain't playing. <laughs> you Whoever told me this is going to be an easy interview lied to me. <laughs> no, no. But, but you're making smart sexy, and that's what I like. That's a beautiful thing. Ladies and gentlemen, John Hope Bryant. And that's it for this episode of The Sky's the Limit. If you enjoy the show, make sure that you take a second to subscribe so that you get my new shows when they drop. Also, if you have a minute, I would love for you to leave a review so more people like yourself can discover the show. I'll see you next time. This has been The Sky's the Limit with D Brown. To find out more about D, go to dbrownceo.com. And to connect with the P3 Group, check out the p 3 groupincom The Sky's the Limit is a production of Forbes Books.